Anyone who's been subscribed long enough to have seen my previous travel log over five years ago knows I don't enjoy travel. One of the few places I really love, for some reason, is Las Vegas. Why would the guy who loves frugality and staying at home travel to a place where everything's expensive and people are shoulder to shoulder in overbuilt environments? Why do city slickers want a vacation in tropical islands? Why do those who are most burdened by the harsh existence as a living meme vacation in a fantasy land run by a cartoon mouse? Maybe the point of a vacation is to get away from your daily normalcy. What a tremendous discovery. Please like and subscribe for more revolutionary travel opinions. I live so close to Las Vegas that the 40 minute long flights usually don't even offer drink service. And when they do, there isn't always time to run everyone's payment, so it's just free. I'll admit that as a young man, I hated to come here. But once I realized I don't have to spend the whole trip and the whole bankroll getting blacked out at noon, I realized I could do whatever I want here. If you, dear viewer, are not yet a Vegas veteran, I believe this should be your guide. A complete rundown from someone who went from hater to proselyte. And you can't make a guide to Vegas without covering the single decision that's most likely to impact the entirety of your trip, and that's where to stay. The first decision you have to make is whether you want to stay on the Strip or downtown, also known as Fremont. If we're being realistic, most people are going to stay on the Strip. Fremont Street is cheaper. The gambling payouts are better. There's more history since it's the older, more classic version of Vegas, and there's still a ton to do. And even though there will be some downtown shout outs throughout this video, I'm gonna proceed as if you are staying on the strip. Because if you're here for a work trip or a bachelorette party, you probably are. The question then is, do you wanna be on the north side, the south side, or in the middle? Let me help you narrow it down. If you are budget conscious, if you are coming with kids, or if you are trying to stay away from as much R-rated stuff as possible, pick the south side. That's where you'll find the roller coaster at New York, New York, the Blue Man Group at Luxor, Cirque's Ka and Mad Apple, and the Mandalay Bay Aquarium. It's closer to family-friendly things like Excalibur and the M&M store. If you're more luxury focused, you'll wanna stay on the north side. That's where all the fancy hotels are, think Wynn, Resorts World, Venetian. The center of the strip is probably where you're gonna to wanna to stay if it's your first time, if price isn't a huge issue, or if you have a trip that's gonna last more than two days. One thing that might heavily influence your decision making is whether you have allegiance to MGM properties or Caesars properties. Between the two of them, they own like half of the hotels. Caesars has a commanding center strip presence. Look at this cluster dead set inside the action. Harrah's, Link, Flamingo, Horseshoe, Cromwell, Caesars. You could spend two days bouncing around just this one area and never leave the Caesars ecosystem. MGM has greater presence on the south side, and since that's the budget side, they stand to offer a bit more value. But using that word does trigger the opening of a small can of worms. I want to talk about value for a second. If you are concerned about getting a good deal, now is not the time to visit Las Vegas. Value in Vegas is at an all-time low. There's less free parking than ever. There are little hacks you can do like parking at MGM properties and then applying for a free no monthly fee credit card to get free parking as a benefit. But not only is that a ridiculous value proposition right on its face, but you should be here to vacation, not to run risk versus reward spreadsheets. At the time of this recording, virtually everybody is charging resort fees, and for what? Caesars properties have notoriously bad Wi-Fi speeds, and you only get to connect two devices. If you've got a phone, a tablet, and a laptop, that's already over the limit for one room, and you'll be paying extra money for like five meg internet that's slower than your cell signal, which of course, barely gets any reception inside the hotel rooms. All of the rewards programs are getting ridiculously complicated while providing fewer actual rewards. Two companies own so many properties on the strip and there's not much competition and they're even embroiled in a price fixing suit right now. This is a theme that's gonna come up when you talk about the hotels, the restaurants, and the gambling. The classic notion that you could have a great time in Las Vegas with very little money is non-existent right now. This trip would have cost me a lot more if I wasn't here in February when people are still burnt out from holiday travel and justifiably avoiding the rare bad Vegas weather. But everything is always changing in Las Vegas. The cheap rooms and the free stuff tends to come back when economic hardship hits America. And if you're paying any attention to the news, it usually feels like things might start getting pretty hairy over here at any minute. Socioeconomic forecasting aside, I want this guide to be evergreen. So here are my general tips to booking a hotel. Don't get a place that's off strip just to save money. I know that Google Maps makes it look like the Rio is just one block over, but everything is farther away than it seems. You do not want to start and end your day by trying to cross a freeway by foot. 
do sign up for whatever rewards program the hotel offers before you book it. When I finally decided to book this room at the Aria, I made an account for MGM Rewards and got a $30 per night discount. Do book directly through the hotel. I know this is unintuitive. You look at Google Maps and you see some brand new website called traveldingo.biz and you see that they offer the rooms for half the normal price, but you really don't want to put yourself in a pickle by problem solving at the check-in desk if it turns out to be a shady website. Some of the deals you find on third-party sites are, in fact, too good to be true. Even if you snag a real one, the benefits to booking direct are far too great. After you book your room directly from the hotel, come back and check on the room prices every couple of days. If the prices go up, you can feel good that you got the best deal at the best possible time. If they go down, you can call the hotel and just have your price adjusted very easily. I booked my Aria room a month before my trip, but 10 days before my arrival, I noticed that prices were about $40 cheaper per night. I made the call and saved some money. My room at the Mirage never got any cheaper, but I did see a promo pop up for $75 per night food and drink credits, so I called them and got $150 worth of credit applied to my stay. Unbelievable. Of course, the hotel you choose is going to depend on what your priorities are, so you don't really need me to tell you what to look for. But this decision is probably the one that has the biggest impact on what you do, see, and eat every day, so I want to give at least some archetypes to inform your decision. The link is for millennial partiers. The energy is high, the prices are low, and the focus is on getting rowdy. The Cosmopolitan is the young, aspirational property. Anyone who is big into the golden era of Bon Appetit days is probably going to be into the swanky, trendy elder millennial vibe. You can have egg slut for breakfast, take pictures at the chandelier bar, and momofuku for dinner within a 20-foot radius. Caesars Palace and MGM Grand are like the Coke and Pepsi of the Strip, two flagship offerings from each of the major brands. The pools are fantastic, and there are food court options all the way from halal guys to Michelin-starred restaurants like Joy Rubichon. Resorts World and Mandalay Bay are popular bookends of the North and South Strip, respectively, good for people who want to be near the action but not necessarily in the center of it. Circus Circus is really good for YouTubers and TikTokers who want to make a video titled, Staying at the Worst Hotel in Las Vegas? Planet Hollywood is probably the best value for families, not just because of the room rates, but also because it's next to the Miracle Mile shops, where you find the greatest density of foods cheap enough to feed a whole family. Paris is, I don't know who Paris is for, to be honest. I've never been inside. It feels like it would make way more sense to have a Japan-themed hotel, uh, especially if they put a bidet in each room. But I'm assuming it's a holdover from an era in which we romanticized Paris a little bit more than we do now. Even though the Venetian has the gondolas and the Bellagio has the gravitas, I feel like Park MGM is for the younger generation of Europea booze. Every facade looks like a place you might want to have an Aperol spritz al fresco. It's worth pointing out that this hotel and casino is totally smoke-free, so if you hate the smell of tobacco, this might be where you come hang out the most. I want to give an honorable mention to Circa downtown on Fremont for the people who come here to watch sports and to swim. They've got this wild pool setup called Stadium Swim where you can both loaf in the pool and watch the game, which even though it's not for me, is exactly the kind of remarkable, ridiculous idea that I like about this city. Whichever hotel you do decide on, don't go into it thinking, ah well, I'll just get whatever's cheapest since I'm not going to spend very much time in my room anyway. That's a fair assumption until you factor in how noisy the place might be and how secure the guest areas feel. While the nicer hotels make you scan a room key or at least flash it to security, sometimes I've been in places like the Flamingo where anybody could just get in the elevator and meander around. With all the activity you'll get in on your trip, it's good to get deep regenerative rest every night and that's a lot easier to do when the rooms feel quiet and safe, especially if they've got top tier blackout shades. I spent five days here doing research and gathering footage, so the first half was spent center south at Aria and the second half center north at the Mirage. I also wanted to be in the Mirage because it's my last chance to do so. Hard Rock just bought the property, so everything's getting torn down and replaced with a big guitar-shaped hotel. The volcano show outside, the iconic free activity will be no more, and everyone seems pissed about it. But MGM likes to hold on to their properties without updating them for way too long. That's what happened here, and everyone's kind of worried that might happen to the Cosmopolitan because they just bought them, one of the few cool luxury hotels that isn't a Caesars or MGM property, and it's now in the hands of the brand most notorious for slowly grinding their hotels into the ground. If you're at all invested in the drama of it all, it's a delight to watch unfold in real time. But again, this is meant to be an evergreen guide. If you're watching this five years later, you already know how the drama ends. What you don't know is what I'm going to say next. Surprise, it's dinner time. 
Surely this is the part people expect and want the most. What would the food guy tell you to eat in Las Vegas out of all of these options? And if I can give you some general guidance, it would start with this before any restaurant names even get mentioned. The restaurants close earlier than you might think. Just because you can party till 4 a.m. and gamble till the sun comes up doesn't mean the food that you like is gonna be available past eight. Also, a lot of the restaurants will have wait times that you won't be able to tolerate. If there's a place that you'll be sad not to visit, you have to make a reservation a week in advance, if not a month in advance for the most in-demand ones. And finally, if it exists within you, let go of the idea that you should be looking for the secret underrated spots that only the locals know about. If you were a Las Vegas local, how much of your free time would you honestly spend on the strip? It's crowded, it's expensive. In reality, you're here on vacation and there's no need to act like you're not. This is a place where, all food and entertainment has to perform at the top of its class or else it gets replaced by something better. I am really glad that we were tourists as long as we were because the perspective is just totally different. Waking up every day on strip and spending a week long here really is a different perspective than being able to just drive home and be 20 minutes away. You are not a scrub if you go into a place that's really popular instead of seeking out the secrets. And the trip is not a failure if you end up having some hungover lunch at some no-name restaurant inside your hotel. Every trip has a worst meal of the trip. For this last one, it was a nice, affordable American restaurant that we booked to get a break from all of the luxury dining, but actually it turned out to be a super expensive steakhouse. We saw lobster tacos on the menu and thought, okay, let's go there, not knowing that each one is two centimeters long and served ice cold. I think once the waitress saw that we were all ordering the cheapest stuff on the menu, she realized that we were brokies who wouldn't leave a massive tip on a giant tab and dialed the service down accordingly. And still, through it all, we had a great time enjoying the meal for what it was, an excuse to get eight people from three different states around the same table. Still, if choosing what to eat does give you anxiety, the latest trend is your friend. Food halls are all the rage right now. A lot of hotels have always had a sort of mall-style food court with places like Johnny Rockets or Panda Express, but more hotels are offering fancier versions. This Aria food hall has a sushi place, a Middle Eastern place, a Steve Aoki-branded pizza place, and a not-so-subtle rip-off of Egg Slut. I feel like Resorts World started this trend. Their food hall is iconic since the idea was to mimic a night market full of hawker stalls. It's the definitive everybody-do-whatever-they-want solution. You can even swipe a credit card to pour as much or as little beer or wine as you want, and it charges you based on the volume. With these prerequisites out of the way, I want to go into a sort of rapid fire of the general food truths that most people can agree on. The suggestions I'd give to a close personal friend if they asked me where to eat. If brunch is your thing, I'll give the three heavy hitters. Hash house a go-go for budget eaters, you'll get a good portion of food for your money, but if you don't have a reservation, you'll pay with your time instead. Lines here get very long. Mon ami Gabi for middle of the road budgets. It's a little fancier and people love having brunch on the patio because it's directly across the street from Bellagio fountains. You can get a great view and a good meal. Bouchon for the bougie pick. It sounds weird to have ordered the American breakfast at a French restaurant, but I evened it out by also ordering my first escargot. They've got puff pastry on top and tastes like a buttery little land mussel. Crab Benedict was a popular choice at our table, but the chicken and waffles were much tastier than they had any right to be. The chicken is roasted skin on and bone in, and the waffle has bacon and chives in it, and the hunter sauce on top makes for an incredibly savory, not too heavy gravy. If you're a vegetarian, most of the restaurants here have their menus online, and you can always check ahead of time to see if there's something for you to order. But if there's a whole mess of vegetarians, you might be interested in Crossroads. It's located inside Resorts World, and the whole restaurant is vegan. If going that far north is too much of a trek, Truth and Tonic at the Venetian is a little closer, and they're also vegan. Nobu has a $100 all-vegan omakase, and China Poblano inside of the Cosmopolitan has a vegetarian version of their Chinese-Mexican fusion tasting menu for $45 a person. Le Cirque at the Bellagio has an eight-course vegan menu for $425 if you're looking for a Michelin-starred vegan meal. There is an ungodly number of celebrity chef restaurants here, and if there's a celeb you love, just follow your heart. I don't like any of the Gordon Ramsay restaurants. I don't like Giada's restaurant. I always thought Dominique Ansel, the guy who invented the cronut, was a butthead, but his pastry shop at Caesars 
is delightful. These glossy sweets are incredible to look at. He may still be resting on his cronut laurels, but I'm no longer a hater. Same for Mr. Robert Flay. I never liked him as a teen, watching him perform as the perpetual heel on shows like Beat Bobby Flay and Entourage. He's a red-headed fire crotch. He's a genetic mistake. But his new restaurant, Amalfi, inside of Caesars is undeniably delicious. His focaccia single-handedly sent me into a personal spiral of trying to replicate it at home for three months. The point is, some of these celebrity chef's restaurants are legitimately great, but the name is the draw, so I don't think I'll ever have the desire to visit The Bedford by Martha Stewart. But if you really like a celebrity chef with a restaurant here, I say try it out at least once. If celebrity is not of concern, but budget is, there are a couple of standouts. Taco Bell Cantina is effectively just a Taco Bell, but you can get a Baja Blast slushy with liquor in it. You can eat here if you're too drunk to speak because you order at a touchscreen kiosk, and honestly, you won't be able to speak to anyone here anyway. The music is extremely loud. My main gripe with this place is that there's just one single serve restroom for a Taco Bell full of drunk people. What da? Nacho Daddy is a little step up from Taco Bell, but it's still beloved for its approachable pricing. And both restaurants are within walking distance of the Miracle Mile Shops, the place near Planet Hollywood with all of the cheaper stuff. The Miracle Mile Shops is also home to Ocean One Grill, the self-proclaimed busiest restaurant in Las Vegas. There was a noticeable uproar when prices here went up by a dollar because budget eating is their whole claim to fame. If you're up on the north end of the strip, my favorite cheap restaurant over here is Tacos El Gordo. I feel like every Mexican has some point in their life where they say, the tacos cost how much? For those? But Tacos El Gordo presents the classic value proposition. Tacos muy rico y suave for a couple bucks. None of these budget stops are secret at all. Depending on the time, waits can be pretty brutal. On the opposite end of the price spectrum are all of the Michelin star restaurants. Joel Rubichon, Michael Mina, Wing Lei, the first Chinese restaurant in the US to ever get a star. I doubt a ton of my viewers are in the market for dinners this expensive, but if you're out there, allow me to direct you to patreon.com slash shack. Moving on. If you're more of a hot dogs and dive bar kind of person, I'd advise you to don some walking shoes and hit a one-two punch of Ellis Island and Stage Door. They're a little east of the strip, but they're east of that dead center sweet spot next to the BattleBots arena. Ellis Island has karaoke, $5 craps tables, and they serve cheap barbecue that a lot of people really like for the price. From the outside, Stage Door looks like a corner store on the walk back to your hotel, but it's a full-on bar and casino inside. The Strip is mostly a place of glitz and polish, so I love the fact that you can find a grimier place to let loose nearby. If you're majorly into dive bars, you're probably staying downtown anyway. That's where you'll find Hogs and Heifers, the biker bar that inspired Coyote Ugly, and Atomic Liquors, a historic old bar where people used to get on the roof and watch the atomic bombs go off in the distance. While I'm on the topic of off-strip eating, of course, I have to mention my beloved Lotus of Siam. You already know I love it, and they've come so far from the original strip mall location that I first visited that they certainly don't need my help. Obviously, this is the jewel of Las Vegas. When you come to Vegas, this is a must. So quickly and predictably, I will mention that I really do adore this place. They've even started offering menu options that bundle their most popular dishes together so you don't have to worry about what to order once you get there. The other off-strip honorable mention is Esther's Kitchen. It's in the art district between the Strip and downtown, and if you've got the time and the transportation, it could provide a great break from all of the commotion. As far as clustered little areas of activity outside the Strip go, the Arts District and downtown are certified classic. The Container Park is wholly overrated, and Chinatown is surprisingly underrated. If affordable Asian cuisine is your jam, there's a whole lot of it here, and if it isn't, you can still come down and have a drink at Golden Tiki. It's got to be the coolest bar inside of a strip mall, complete with a live DJ and a full-service presentation that's more fun than the hoity-toity bars you'll find on the Strip. If you are very appearance-minded, I picked three suggestions for IG-worthy photo ops. Catch inside the Aria has an entryway that was made for taking photos. You don't even have to go into the restaurant. You can just come into the tunnel and snap some pics and leave. Spiegel World has a bar and restaurant named Ski Lodge and Super Frico, respectively, inside of the Cosmopolitan. The bar is super aesthetic with a Ski Lodge theme, and Super Frico is like if the Magic Castle was run by Rick and Morty stands. Funky, freaky performers come up to your table to provide entertainment, and hard to explain photo ops. Finally, the pepper mill here on the north end. This is, gastronomically speaking, just a glorified Denny's. The portions are huge and affordable, but it's one of those iconic places that not only gets you a couple respect points online for paying homage to a classic, but does have a definitive look to it that makes for great photos or even just a casual hang at the fireside lounge. 
If you are the type to wish for getting the coolest meals at the most underground secretive places, you should probably look to an influencer other than myself. I don't personally understand the desire to know about the secrets of a destination, especially when the destination is so dense with obvious ubiquitous things to enjoy. I know that this must tickle a special part of a ton of people's brains because so many establishments tuck little shops into dark corners to make them look low key, even though there's signage inside the rooms that tells the guests, please visit these places. Like Easy's, it's the newest speakeasy inside the Aria, directly behind the donut shop. I think the cocktails inside are like 50 bucks, but that's the price of elite secrecy. I know that this whole place is kind of predicated on lying to yourself, even though a lot of stuff is fake, like the fake Paris and the fake gondolas or whatever, but the idea of a fake speakeasy is particularly egregious, I think, because it's mm. just like, at the Aria, they have those tablets that's like, try our new speakeasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easies. Yeah. It's right here by the donut <laughs> shop. And it's then you like, go you and you're like, hey, can I get in? I know the secret code and the password. They're like, no, no, no. give me $1,000, please. Not you. Yeah, the, not you. <laughs> the, the, the password is give me your money. Yeah. yeah. Cosmo Next Door has an unmarked pizza shop called Secret Pizza on the third floor. You'll know that you made it when you see the hallway of records. Downtown, there's another secret speakeasy called The Laundry Room, and if you want to go, you'll definitely need a reservation. It is usually booked solid well in advance. Generally, if you are into the secret stuff, I say follow some TikTokers who focus specifically on that. They're more likely to actually live here and update you on the month-to-month -month changes. A lot of the secret stuff that I knew about from my past visits doesn't even exist anymore, and that's another reason why I can't get down with the concept. There's no bonding with other people over places you've been if the places you like to visit are either unheard of or gone. I think it would be a mistake to talk about what to eat in Las Vegas without mentioning what to drink, and that is water. It is very hot here. It is very dry here. You're gonna be walking a lot. You're gonna be drinking too much. So order water at every meal, maybe instead of a cocktail, uh, get uh, ice from the ice machine at the hotel and make yourself a cocktail of purified ice and bathroom sink tap water. Uh, bring a water bottle and just fill it up whenever you can. Or if you have to have purified water, maybe go to a CVS or an ABC store on the strip. You gotta drink water like your life depends on it because it does. You have to find a way to drink a lot of water when you're walking up and down a concrete island in the middle of the desert all day. Coffee drinkers know that it can be hard to get sometimes, especially if you must have Starbucks, where the lines can get pretty nutty when everyone from every nearby hotel wants a latte at the exact same time. I hoped to give you a tip like order online and pick it up from the counter, but the Starbucks locations here get so busy that they'll turn off mobile ordering altogether. I have so many Cometeer pods from past ad reads I've done for them that it's easy enough to pack six of them in my insulated water bottle to keep them frozen on the flight and then make my own coffee every morning. Most of this list has been general advice for most people. These restaurants are well loved because they provide the food that a lot of people like. But I think one restaurant earns the title of place on the strip that I come back to most frequently and that's Roy Choi's best friend. The food is great and the environment is also a joy to be in. Service has always been faster, friendlier, and more attentive than any of the restaurants that cost twice as much. The menu has a real sense of place. Here's the stuff that I'd normally serve you and here's the stuff I dialed up to 11 for the sake of Vegas's love for excess. You like Hennessy and Coke at home? Maybe in Vegas you want to try it in slushy form. Reservations can be hard to get, but that's how you get a table in the back with the live DJ and room to dance. If you don't get a table, you can just put your name on the list when they open and wait for them to call you. You'll probably be given a table up front in the bodega area, but that's not really much of a downgrade. I've deliberately killed tons of time at Park MGM in this exact scenario, and if you don't want to gamble the time away, you could just go to Juniper. It's a gin-forward fancy cocktail bar, and I wish that more hotels would put a darker, quieter place to just be, aside from all the action, but the service here was remarkably slow, the cocktails were more style than substance, and when it came time to close out, they just sort of dropped one of those electronic card reader things on us and said, pay it, split it, whatever, just figure it out. Bye. So I can't recommend it. Instead, kill time at Italy. It might actually be the runner up for a strip restaurant I visited most frequently, but that's mostly because each one of these visits was spent waiting for tables at Best Friend, fighting off hunger pangs as the wait list drags longer into the night. The format of everybody getting exactly what they want, provided that they want something Italian, without having to wait for a table, just works. There are separate lines for Roman style pizza, Neapolitan style pizza, pasta, sandwiches, seafood, sweets, and since all of that labor is divided into its own categories, things come out pretty quickly. I'd say that most of the offerings are familiar, but you can find some surprises too, like this arancini with ragu inside. 
Bonus fact, the croc-clad sex pest that surrendered his minority ownership of Italy isn't part of the branding at all anymore, so you can easily compartmentalize all of that way into the back of your mind while you enjoy a nice sandwich. I want to close this section by insisting that you try not to worry about wasting a meal on an overrated or overly mainstream restaurant. I know that at least one New Yorker is watching this thinking, bro, don't go to Momofuku in Las Vegas. It's not even that good in the flagship location. Same for Din Tai Fung. But you gotta understand that this city is a destination for tons of people from all over the world. I realize that this may be someone's only chance to try In-N-Out Burger. So even though I would never make the time for a double-double on the Vegas Strip, I totally understand the appeal. I'm coming from Phoenix, where there's a shocking amount of overlap. The Henry, Toka Madera, Scramble, STK, Cornish Pasty, Mastro's Ocean Club, Nobu, Ghost Donkey, these are all places that I can visit at home, so they're not on my Vegas list. But you will catch me finally trying Peter Luger's for the first time after it opens at Caesars. Wherever you are in Las Vegas, there will be something good to eat nearby. The question that remains then is how to fill the time in between meals. Maybe the most effective way to talk about how to have a good time in Las Vegas is to first outline how to have a horrible time. Like maybe you wanna wake up early, uh, put on your most stylish, uncomfortable shoes, grab a yard long frozen alcoholic slushy, get your ATM card because we're gonna need a little gambling money. Not too much, we can always come back to the ATM later on. Uh, also, don't really start planning your meals until you're already hungry. And if you do go day drinking, just remember, you gotta rally all night long. Naps are for the week. The what to do portion of any Vegas guide is the most difficult part to put together because it depends so much on what kind of person you are. You can race cars, shoot guns, fly in a helicopter, or sit in a pool all day. Instead of getting into the minutia of all of the thousands of highly specialized things you can do here, I'll briefly cover some of the popular choices. There is a high concentration of Cirque du Soleil shows here, ranging from themed to abstract, and the performances are in fact very impressive. And if you're disappointed to hear that I enjoy something so ubiquitous, wait until you hear how I feel about those classic blue men. I think the blue man group is the most agreeable performance humanity has ever produced. Compare the blue man group to a magic act like Shin Lim. You don't need to know what a deck of cards is to be like, wow, that blue fella is catching marshmallows in his mouth with remarkable accuracy. You don't even need to speak English to enjoy it. But if you find Blue Men too generic and Cirque shows too mystical, Spiegel World puts on a series of shows that all have the same performance art of Cirque with a layer of adult humor on top. There will be more comedy, more talking, and more of a deliberate theme. There is a part in every Vegas guide where they mention all the free stuff to do here, things like the Bellagio Fountain, the Winds Lake of Dreams, the animatronic show at Caesars, and the world's largest chocolate fountain. And while it is true that these activities are free, they usually only last for a couple of minutes. Don't expect to show up at the Bellagio Conservatory and walk around for an hour like you would at a normal-sized botanical garden. We're also losing a local legend as soon as the volcano show in front of the Mirage goes down and replaced by a giant guitar-shaped hotel, so that's one less free attraction. If you're dead set on doing a meaningful amount of free stuff, do it downtown at Fremont where free entertainment pops up on multiple stages every night, plus a giant audiovisual show above your head every hour on the hour. I spend most of my time in a constant vector from one restaurant to another, but if you're coming with a big group of people, it can be hard for everyone to decide on one place to go, and even harder to get enough tickets. Consider then Area 15. It's big enough to handle big groups, dense enough to take up several hours of time, and enough variety to accommodate a group that's full of people who might want to visit Omega Mart and people who want to have a drink 130 feet above the ground. I do understand that clubbing day and night is a popular Vegas activity, but I am not the guy to look to for help on that. All I've got for you is that as long as you're not a big group of dudes, you should be able to get into clubs for free. You used to have to find a promoter to get on the guest list, but they're all on Instagram now, so you can just search for Promoter Las Vegas and find one. You'll know that they're legit if they get you onto the list for free. If someone tries to get money from you in exchange for list inclusion, they're not a real promoter. Also, it would kind of defeat the purpose, no? I got free entry into a Four Color Zach show to prove in this video that a good reason to go to a club is to see a DJ you like since you're not likely to make any meaningful connections in a Las Vegas club, but I fell asleep before the doors even opened. Sorry, Brian. During the day, you truly can have a gay old time just walking around, reveling in all the things to see, imagining a better America that's all this walkable. And if you're not feeling so charitable, hey, you can just as easily walk around and mope. Look at all these overstimulated sheep walking around in clumps. They can't even stand 10 minutes without a drink in their hands. And for what? 
to go see someone's residency, the real-life version of Michael Jordan at Moron Mountain in Space Jam. What an affront to God and humanity this place is. But you better at least channel that energy into a song or a poem or some kind of tortured art. Otherwise, are you any better than any of us livestock? I will say there are a couple activities you'll never find me doing. The high roller happy hour where you spend a half hour on a giant ferris wheel trying to pound as many unlimited drinks as possible while also trapped in the sky a hundred feet above the closest bathroom. Not for me. I think that any mid-tier buffet is a waste too since there's so much to eat I wouldn't want to waste two meals on a five times more expensive version of Golden Corral. One of my favorite things to do here is actually to enjoy a cigar. Think about it. You're in one of the few places in America where you can smoke indoors. The hotels have incredible air filtration systems. You're probably full from your most recent meal. And the longer you sit, the more free beverages come your way. It's a cigar smoker's dream environment. I wanted to talk about cigars on this channel ever since I got into the hobby. And this was supposed to be my entry point for saying everything I want to say about them. But this is already such a long video that I'll save all of that for a later date. For now, all I will say is that whether you're chief in a stove or not, it can be surprisingly enjoyable to just find a place to sit alone or with friends and have a nice moment of not doing anything together. All these floor plans are designed to keep you stimulated and spending money, so if it gets hard to find a communal space for a break, just go find the closest sports book. They all have really comfortable chairs, some of them are dark and moody, others are energetic with casual activities like pool tables, and it's an underrated attraction for getting everyone together without necessarily eating, drinking, or gambling. And that word triggers the opening of a large can of worms. Here we go. The biggest surprise is that as soon as I walked in, I was assaulted with a big whiff of an aroma called Asian Gardens. Yeah. And that is the exact perfume that they use at Dave & Buster's. Right. I don't know if it's a perfume. It's a way of being. It's a lifestyle it's a aroma. And it makes me feel like, <laughs> oh, I'm in Las Vegas. And it smells like the place where I spend the most money for nothing. <laughs> Dave & Buster's. Yeah. Funny how they have that in common. Yeah. I'll drop $100 for like a little bracelet that says eat, play, win. And here I can actually win something. Right. And win you did. Well, I don't know if we want to talk about my big epic win because it might promote gambling, but I did oh. I did do quite well yesterday. Yeah, it was fun. So well that my ears started burning and I kind of got shortness of breath and I thought I might pass out and I was getting very scared. And I cashed out and like went to the bathroom, went somewhere dark for the rest of the night. It was, it was kind of um, shocking. I haven't felt that way since our wedding. What a rush. Yeah. <laughs> This is a lesson on gambling, which is something that you, if you're smart, never do. You're guaranteed to lose in the long term. It can turn into an addiction more quickly than you expect. And since it's an addiction that you can hide, it's especially dangerous. You can sense when someone's been out all night drinking or taking drugs in the middle of the workday, but the people closest to you can't really notice anything's wrong if you're just on your phone losing money. I have a particular gripe against these mobile betting apps that are catching on. They're making a huge push towards micro betting, trying to shift the culture into casually dropping $5 on a couple bets every weekend. Make no mistake, I do not condone gambling of any kind ever. But if I were to make a whole guide to Las Vegas just to be like, don't do it, okay, see ya, it wouldn't be realistic or helpful. People are gonna gamble here. And if you want to dabble, you might as well know how. Also, I apologize, I won't be able to show very much of my own footage in this video. Cameras are still a big no-no in casinos for some reason. I insist it's an archaic rule, but I also don't want to lose my camera in five days worth of footage. So he aggressively said, uh, sir, uh, we have a very strict policy. No professional video recording equipment is allowed in the rooms. We need to confiscate your camera right now. Can I please have it? Right when I denied him, I guess, he immediately said, oh, that's it. Uh, sir, we're trespassing you. We need you to uh, immediately evacuate the premises. Uh, you can't stay here tonight and you will not be refunded. Again, value in Las Vegas is at an all time low right now. The minimum dollar amounts just to play have gone way up. And if you hit a hot streak, the maximums have come way down. You don't get free drinks as easily anymore. You used to be able to sit at a slot machine and slowly spin away a dollar and get a drink for free. But now some machines have little lights on the back that lets servers know, hey, don't give this person a free drink until they've spent enough to turn the light on. The payouts are smaller, the odds are worse. A table that used to pay out triple for a dice roll of 12 might only pay double now. 
You might only get paid six to five on a blackjack instead of three to two. Even downtown casinos on Fremont, where the odds and the payouts are always better, don't have the promos that they used to, where you could just go up and spin a big wheel and win some free play. Basic strategy in Vegas is everything that's free, do it. In fact, when you talk about free, right here, this is free. An absolute free spin, right? Free for us? It's free. You can win Oh. That's good. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. See what I'm talking about? This wasn't crappy, man. This is good. I think a big part of this value problem is that people are still playing. Why reverse course when the tables are still full, even with crummy odds and crazy minimums? So if you take anything away from my gambling lesson, it's this. Never play on a blackjack table where blackjack pays out six to five and never play roulette at a table with a zero, double zero, and a triple zero. On its face, it's easy to say who the heck would willingly play roulette on a table with a whole extra zero on it, but these tables make it hard to notice by decorating that third zero with something like the hotel logo. If these two practices can die out, we will have made a meaningful difference. The question I always ask is, why do you want to gamble? And you've got to answer honestly. People want to say, to win, of course, but we already know statistically you won't, so why do you really want to play? Do you like that big dramatic feeling of putting a lot on the line? Do you like passing time as a low roller just to get the experience while trying to lose as little as you can? Do you like the strategic element of learning how a game works and how to optimize it to your play style? Depending on what you're trying to get out of this, this is what I would advise people to play. Craps for a sense of community. Everybody gets around a big table and if things go well, celebrate together. Pi gal for passing the time without turning your brain off the way that you would for slots. Pi gal hands result in a ton of draws, so you can go a relatively long time without losing or winning. Roulette for earning comps. When casinos give out rooms and special treatment, they use a complicated system to determine what they call your rating. On a dice game, you're usually not gonna earn meaningful comps since it's too hard to calculate your ratings, but on roulette, you'll at least get a free buffet after losing your whole retirement fund. Electronic table games or ETGs are for playing table games at lower minimums without having to get interpersonal with anyone. Whether you don't feel confident enough or you just don't feel sociable, you can place bets on these digital versions of popular games. And since you can bet at an incredibly slow pace, you might post up at one just to get a couple free Red Bull vodkas. Slots are a popular choice for people who want to play the easiest game possible while still waiting for big moments of excitement. The graphics and the sound design on each machine is expertly crafted to hype you up. It's kind of a shame that they're so well loved, but I'll talk about slots more later on. Also, there is blackjack, which is probably my least favorite table game for admittedly a stupid reason. People love to play blackjack because it has the lowest house edge, but I think this is such a silly reason to gamble. To explain this, I'm gonna have to go into a whole diatribe on house edge, so here we go. The house edge is like a little haircut off the top of long-term play that the casino gets to set and keep for themselves. If I bet on black at a roulette table, that's a 50-50 chance, so a bet pays accordingly, even money. But don't forget, there's also a zero and a double zero, which makes the odds a tiny bit less than 50-50, even though the payout remains the same as if it was 50-50. That disparity is the house edge. If I say, let's do a coin flip, every time it lands on heads, you give me a dollar, and every time it lands on tails, I give you a dollar, you can still hit an unlucky streak and lose money, especially if I add a little house edge, like if the coin falls off the table, I automatically win. Remember that these are calculations based on long-term play. The casino is the one doing a million coin flips per hour. You're only doing a few of them. So people who like to play blackjack just because it has the lowest house edge are always a little bit goofy to me. First of all, the low house edge statement is based on the assumption that you play with perfect basic strategy. If you haven't studied enough to make the mathematically best move on every hand, the real house edge might be not much different than a session on the roulette table. I can't imagine wanting to do homework for fun, and that's what it feels like. But Blackjack attracts the kind of guy who wants to feel strategic, like maybe one day he could learn how to count cards. Not understanding that even a superhuman card counting ability brings the house edge to negative 1%, and even if he did, he'd be banned from all the casinos anywhere. The general public knowing about it has probably been a boon for us because people think they can come out and do it, and they really can't. I wish I did not hold this contempt for a very specific type of card game player. I know there are a lot of blackjack heads watching this. I am no better than you, as my favorite game is a mindless roll of the dice. But if house edge is what you're after, why do all that mental work when you could just belly up to a craps table 
table, bet the pass line with max odds, and play against what is pretty much the same house edge. At least then you can turn your brain off, get as many free mind-altering beverages as you want without it affecting your win rate, and without any grumps getting mad at you about stealing their card. This is why I ask, what is your reason for gambling? There's often a different way to achieve what you want out of it. Like if your whole thing is, I just want to put $100 on red at the roulette table. I don't want to learn the rules to any games. I don't want to sit and grind for an hour. I just want to place one bet and either win or lose. Then why not just put that $100 on the field at craps? You get a little bit more excitement. If a field number rolls, you win. If it doesn't, you lose. But if a 2 or a 12 roll, which is unlikely, you get paid double or triple what you normally would. It's similar to red versus black, but with a rare chance to win more than just even money. Unless you play for the drama of putting it all on a couple numbers, roulette is usually all about spreading your money out, grinding. If you're a stock trader, think of it like shorting the VIX. You're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, spreading out a big total bet across lots of numbers, which gets you a nice high rating for comps, and hoping to win a bunch of tiny payouts. Of course, if any of the bad numbers hit, you'll need like a dozen wins in a row just to come back to even. Two underrated games are Kino and Baccarat. The rules to Baccarat are extremely complicated, but the actual play could not be simpler. It's just war with extra steps. You place a bet on one of two outcomes, like a coin flip. Think of player versus banker like heads versus tails. A bunch of cards get dealt out according to a complex set of rules, and either the player or the banker has the better hand. If the player wins and you bet on player, you win. Simple as. Statistically, the banker is slightly more likely to win most of the hands, but to make up for that, casinos will take a small commission off of your winnings if you bet banker and win. So essentially just a coin flip, but the kind of coin flip James Bond would play. The game just has a fancy reputation because of its exotic name, weird rule set, and high minimum bet per hand. The reason I say Kino is underrated is because it's just as random and brainless as slots, but also with Kino, you can see the pay tables. The big reason why slots suck is because you have no idea what the odds are. With Kino, you pick some random numbers and you can see if five of my numbers hit, I win this much. But with slots, you just press a button and the outcome is the outcome. Each machine can be dialed in to pay out less or more. And if you don't know which is which, you can pretty fairly assume that the more expensive luxury hotels are less likely to pay out. After all, these slot losses have to pay for all that luxury. You can also assume that licensed games pay out slightly worse. The ones that are crazy rich Asians branded or Dolly Parton themed have to pay the requisite licensing fees so you can assume that they pay out slightly less to make up for that. I think the only way that you can justify playing slots is if there's a huge progressive jackpot or if someone left a machine too early. For example, this machine has a string of firecrackers that light up as you play, so if someone leaves all but one firecracker lit, it'll be easier for you to swoop in and snag it. But all of this requires you to learn the rules and intricacies of the slot machine, and I think most people who play this notoriously bad game are typically in it for casual play that doesn't require any strategy. So if I am to provide a gambling guide, I'd rather convince you to strategize your bankroll management instead of talking about play strategies. I think you should decide how much money you're comfortable losing and take that cash out at an ATM back home before you even arrive. If you might struggle with discipline, leave your debit card behind so you don't take out any more. I think the natural way to think about money you come with is with a sense of I'm up or I'm down. But in my opinion, the tactical way to think about it is in terms of so-called bullets. If you know you want to play blackjack at a $15 table on Friday night and you're allocating $1,500 to play, you have 100 bullets. That's money to fund 100 hands on the totality of your play session. Some of them will hit. Most of them will miss, and after those 100 bullets are spent, you leave the table and count how much you've walked away with. This way you're not chasing after your lost bets when you're down or pissing away so-called house money when you're up. You know that a slot machine is going to require a lot of bullets. The likelihood that you pull that lever for a dollar a spin and hit anything with just five bullets is extremely low. The general procedure at a craps table is to have enough money for at least 10 different shooters. So if you want to place three $10 bets on each come out roll, that's $300 for 10 bullets. Before I continue, a pop quiz. Let's say I put 23 randomly selected people in one room. What are the odds that any two of them share the same birthday? Well, statistically, it's about 50-50. 
We as humans are unfathomably bad at probability. I spent some time in chat rooms for free slots apps and shady Bitcoin gambling websites, and the way that we talk about games of chance can be legitimately horrifying. Like, has anyone done any tests to see if the slots pay out more frequently when you stop the reels manually instead of letting them auto spin? And if you're playing on your phone, is it possible that the device knows if you're looking at the screen and pays out when you're actually looking? Or maybe it takes your heart rate data and uses that to inform the odds? If you catch yourself falling victim to any one of the following ways of thinking, even a little bit, it is 100% time to stop immediately. That includes, the good outcome hasn't come up in a really long time. That means it should be due soon. If this side bet has 30 to 1 odds, I'll just wait until it doesn't hit 29 times in a row and then start betting. What if I put 10 bucks on this bet, and then if it loses, I put 20 on the next one, and then 40 on the next one after that? The last five spins landed on black numbers, so I should bet red. After all, what are the odds of it hitting black six times in a row? I bring these fallacies up because they're so compelling. Really, what are the odds of a little ball landing on the same colored number a bunch of times in a row? But like the birthday experiment, we usually can't really grasp the weight of the odds. That's why people don't pick one, two, three, four, five, six as their lottery numbers. It makes it way too obvious how improbable winning really is. We go to play the Mega Millions. You remember it was a billion dollars. Everybody was talking about it. And this bitch afterwards, I said, which numbers did she choose? She shows me her paper and she chose one, 11, 22, 33, 44, 55, Powerball, 66. Why is that crazy? You can choose any number. Why yeah. is it crazy? Why is the that crazy? Odds, the odds are all the same though. No, it's yes, not. Yes, that's it what is. I'm the saying. odds are, that's no matter what, what the numbers are. And this no, bitch, for them to be in a sequence, the odds are way greater. You're both idiots. No. I, I do one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's what don't. I do. Yeah, I do. It doesn't Every matter. Every time, it, it doesn't does matter. matter. No, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. Nope. You don't statistically. You see the, so you think the odds are different she if thinks, you do random she numbers. She she's hacked a lot of yeah. she's never think, If you like the idea of playing some table games but can't get over how expensive it is, consider visiting Casino Quest on the North Strip inside of Fashion Show Mall. You can book some private lessons, learn the rules and etiquette, and play for an hourly fee instead of losing a bunch of real money. Casino Quest has a YouTube channel where they banter while playing table games, and it's probably the biggest parasocial relationship I've ever developed for a YouTube channel. With this system, you can either win it all or lose it all with just this system, dude. What do you think? Yeah, it sounds like every other roulette system we've done for the last four years. <laughs> all right, let's see how and it goes. I even stopped in to do their 30 roll challenge where you get 300 fake dollars and 30 rolls to try to make the most money and get on the leaderboard. I think this destination is especially compelling if you came to Vegas with a big group of coworkers for a business trip. I've gone to office Christmas parties at casinos and it is incredibly bleak to see the C-suite playing blackjack at $50 a hand while middle management plays nickel slots and the peons sit idly by just to watch. The workplace is already such a disaster of culture and class and introducing gambling to that equation only makes it worse. Here, you can reserve a few hours for everyone in your department to play on regulation tables with real chips and still get that Vegas experience. This has got to be the longest you've ever heard me talk about anything uninterrupted. I can't go on like this much longer. I will close this big Vegas guide out with the one thing that viewers always want the most, pithy little hacks and tips. It is very easy to get lost in here. Totally. To We've both gotten room. lost. There's several forks in the road, and at every fork you see at least one couple looking at the signs like, what? And it doesn't help that we're on floor 22 in room 216. So you look at the numbers, it's like 22... 216 or 2201, like the signs make no sense. Do you think people will now request to be in this room since you said the room you were yeah, in? Yeah, I hope so. This is the shack suite. I don't like that there is a mini fridge that's just full of items for sale that you can't put your own stuff in the mini fridge or else they'll charge you. So. Yeah, I hate that. I hate that so much. And I think that's a pretty common thing now. It is about checkout time, so we are going to check out and go to the Bellagio Conservatory before walking our way to the Mirage on the north side of the Strip to do the rest of our trip. Sounds good. See you at the north. And will people know that you're pregnant by now? Yeah, you in, get the first cut. In the least child-friendly place of them all. <laughs> Here we go. Check hotel prices and flight prices before you commit to a date to come. One time we came because flights were cheap, not knowing that the When We Were Young Festival got rescheduled to that weekend. And boy, what a pickle we were in. I never want to spend more than $30 for a night at the Flamingo ever again, much less the $400 I spent. Expect wild fluctuations in day-to-day -day room rates. 
pack some snacks like jerky or crackers, learn a play style for your chosen game and maybe one backup. When you land, skip Uber and just take a taxi to the hotel. Taxis have fixed rates without the ridiculous surcharges, wait times, and pickup zones that Uber forces you into. At check-in, people all over the internet will tell you there's such thing as a so-called $20 trick. In reality, these days, that's more of a $20 tip. If you actually want special treatment for under-the-table tips, be prepared to give at least 50 or 100, and at that point, you're better off just buying a better room. Most of the time, you have to pay extra for a mini fridge in your room that you can store liquor and leftovers in, but if you want a free one and you're comfortable being a weaselly little liar, call the front desk and tell them that you have a breast milk or a medication that requires refrigeration. Just because weed is legal here doesn't mean that you can smoke it in the hotel. If you want to earn rewards without carrying a rewards card around, charge everything to your room. Drinks, food, anything that can be charged to your room will be counted towards rewards points, and if you're at a Caesars or an MGM property, a ton of establishments will let you charge it to your room. If you're here to swim, ask the front desk if you're allowed access to any other pools during your stay. You might be allowed to swim at the fancy Caesars hotel even if you're just staying at the link. If you're staying at the MGM Grand, pack a pool floaty so that you can use the Lazy River for free without renting an inner tube. If you're visiting pools with a big group, it may actually be worth getting a pool cabana. If everyone's going to be ordering pool drinks, a big group can hit the minimum for a cabana pretty easily. You might be a fast walker, but that doesn't mean everyone around you is. Your 10-minute walk between destinations can become a 20-minute walk if you get stuck behind a pack of slowpokes. There are people on the strip who will ask you if you want to take a picture. Know that these pictures cost money and you should ask how much beforehand. You don't want to get into a public fight because some guy in an Elmo costume suddenly decides it's $90 for a pic. The hard part for me is how to say no to the photos because some of these people are really insistent. I have a 100% success rate saying, Sorry, I'm way too high and anxious right now. If anybody talks to me, I will scream. If escorts are on offer, know that prostitution is not actually legal here, and that those prices on the ad are just to get the girl in your room for negotiations, not for the whole package. The claw machine is pure RNG, just like a slot machine. If the claw determines that it's your turn to win, you can slam the joystick in any direction, drop the claw, and still win. Penny slots have the worst payouts. You're better off betting 10 units on the nickel machine than you are betting 50 units on a penny slot. If you go see the Vegas sign, take an Uber. There isn't enough parking to make the drive worth it. Order water instead of alcohol with your meal at every restaurant unless there's something you really want to try. Every restaurant has an uninspired riff on the old fashioned or the martini. Save your money for bars that specialize in good drinks. And if you're in it for the buzz, just go get free drinks at the casino instead. I usually order a cognac on ice because a lot of time, the only cognac that they have is Hennessy and it arrives in a glass full of the stuff. If you're sitting in one spot of the casino for a long time to drink for more than an hour, tip big on your first drink order. Your server will come back more often and provide better service. Always tip your dealers, especially at a craps table. There's a lot of hard math going on with these payouts and if you tip properly, you might be more likely to have a math error made in your favor. If you do think the prices for a drink or a hotel or a meal are too expensive, do not go there. All of these insane price trends only work because there doesn't seem to be much pushback. They raise prices and we keep paying. If you gamble a lot, keep track of your losses. They might be tax deductible, especially if you end up getting a big taxable win. Do not go into any sales pitches for timeshares. The ATM fees are high here. Take out cash before you come. You can get a little cash back at CVS, but I've also heard that you can deposit money into your hotel's sports book on your phone and then withdraw the cash in person for free. Your mileage may vary. I've never actually tried it. Don't burn yourself out on the first day. That goes for walking and drinking and spending. This place is exciting, especially on your first time when you first arrive, but try to pace yourself. The desert may surprise you with how cold it gets at night. Check weather forecasts before you pack. You usually only want to stay at one hotel for the whole trip because checkout at point A is at 11 and check in at point B is at 3. Everyone charges for late checkout, especially at 1 p.m. or later. But if you call the front desk on the morning of, you're usually able to check out at noon for no additional cost. If you check out early but don't fly out until the evening, know that every hotel will hold on to your bags for free. Just expect to tip when you come back to get them. The monorail and the rental bikes sound like a good idea, but they're really only good for getting to very specific locations with a party of one or two. It's usually cheaper, faster, and easier to book a ride and split the cost among each traveler. 
And finally, don't rely too much on travel guides. Even this one. Las Vegas changes so quickly all the time, so a six month old video might not be accurate anymore. Simultaneously, the types of local influencers who talk about this place every day by the nature of their platform have to talk about the newest developments. So the old proven standards get a little bit left behind. If you try to optimize your whole itinerary on the first or second visit, you might not be leaving yourself open to all of the random encounters. You don't wanna skip over the discovery phase and get straight to the nerd phase. At this point, I feel dangerously close to the hidden Mickey hunters walking around pulling moves like, uh, that's where Tupac got shot. That bathroom lets you pee on a real piece of the Berlin Wall. This is actually paradise. Nice. I know that whether you're just buying a toothbrush or planning a weekend trip, the internet can make you feel like you need to become an expert before finalizing a game plan, but Las Vegas is the definitive home of doing precisely whatever you want to do at that specific time, provided you've got the money for it. If you do have any specific things you'd like to iron out before your next visit, there will be a whole mess of people in the comments section willing to help answer some of your questions. Ooh, doggy. I've been talking for so long that YouTube just sent me a business card with video essayist in the title. I need a vacation.